Brian, I thank you kindly. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Everybody see my um, screen? I am on mute. Yes. 10 on 10, Rick. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off this uh, session four. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about uh, common dry land cropping systems in the Canadian prairies and, and the management of those systems by our guest speaker today. But I first wanted to start off with what I'm... Um, planning to have is every Monday we'll have a video to kind of get everything started. So let's uh, let's move to the video. Anybody hear that okay? Hi, I'm Devin Hartzler. I'm with Triple H Farms Limited. I farm with my dad, five miles west of Carstairs. I'm doing a plot to farm research trial with Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions to test seeding rates on our wheat and barley crops. On this wheat trial, we implemented three different seeding rates of 25, 30. Oh. Hi, I'm Devin Hartzler. I'm with Triple H Farms Limited. I farm with my dad, five miles west of Carstairs. I'm doing a plot to farm research trial with Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions to test seeding rates on our wheat and barley crops. On this wheat trial, we implemented three different seeding rates of 25, 30, and 35 plants per square foot. On our barley trial, we implemented three different seeding rates as well. We did 22, 27 and a half, and 33 plants per square foot. Well, previously we have um, planted on a bushels per acre and we wanted to see if if putting in different seeding rates was going to make a difference to our overall outcome. We're testing different seeding rates to um, see if we can even out our maturity. Um, doing this trial was very simple. Um, once we have our drill loaded we did everything in one in one load. So higher seeding rates will actually decrease the amount of secondary and tertiary tillers. This is because there's less room and resources for those secondary tillers to occur. There's more plants per square foot, so those less tertiary tillers. So when we do a high plant stand count, we end up with a crop that is, has a higher proportion of main stem tillers. First off, tertiary late tillers typically produce less yield than main head tillers, reducing the yield potential of the crop. Second, those tertiary tillers will actually pull energy from the main head tillers, further reducing the yield potential of the crop. So late tillers can cause issues with variable maturity. This leads to issues at harvest, leading to quality and harvestability challenges. So if you're looking to apply a fungicide at head timing for wheat or barley, whether it be for foliar leaf disease or for fusarium head blight, a higher seeding rate and higher plant stand crop is going to allow for even more, more even crop maturity. So with more even crop maturity, we can apply that head timing fungicide at a better ideal stage across the field and between plants. So at higher seeding rates, you're gonna have less available resources for weeds to grow. This includes sunlight, fertilizer, and water. It also increases crop competitiveness as that canopy closes earlier in the season, leaving less room for weeds to grow. So there's a lot of benefits that come from high seeding rate. However, at high seeding rates, we increase the crop density. That increase in crop density extends the amount of time that that crop is damp. That's because there's less airflow going through it. Uh, so that allows for more time and development of disease within that crop. 
However, no matter what your seeding rate is, it's going to be important to scout and monitor for disease so you can mitigate any impacts. At lower seeding rates, you're more likely to see an increased number of tertiary tillers. Those tertiary tillers typically mature later than the main head tillers, extending the amount of time it takes for the crop to reach maturity. So at lower seeding rates, we're typically going to see a longer time to reach maturity, and at higher seeding rates, we're typically going to see a shorter time to reach maturity. High seeding rates plays an important role in yield, quality, and harvestability. So when it comes to making the most out of every seeded acre, seeding rates is a vital component that should be considered. Okay, um, just before I introduce our speaker today, I would like to just go over a few, I have a few slides here just to kind of remind people of, um, of the expectations of our participants. And again, I would really encourage everyone, we would like to start at 4 p.m. sharp, so I'd really like to encourage everybody, if you can make a good effort to be arrive five to 10 minutes earlier, while the program is on, we'd ask that everybody keep their video camera on so that we can see your wonderful faces. Mute your mic unless you're speaking. And of course, we'd like you to actively participate in the session. Uh, regarding questions and discussion, a couple of options. Use the chat function if you think of a question or put up your hand or use the reaction button at the bottom of your screen that allows you to raise your hand. You will be recognized and then, then you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. And we just would encourage you to ask questions because that's another way of how we learn. Um, for the material that's coming from all sessions, but um, in particular today um, on our Google Drive and everyone here has access to it, you'll find two folders, one on reference material and the other on presentation material. So if we provide you with references to support the program, that'll be in that folder, or if it's the actual PowerPoint slide deck, it'll be in the other folder. And of course, you should have been receiving from me um, after within hopefully a day of, of the, each session, a link to our YouTube channel, but you can also uh, just Google Rotary 5360 YouTube and uh, the NGSE 2022 playlist. And that should, again, be another source of material that can go back to at your time, at your convenience. Uh, just a reminder, this is us. This is Canada. We have 10 provinces and three territories. Um, the distance, farthest distance, from east coast to west coast, or the most easterly or most westerly points, is about 5,500 kilometers. And from the very southern tip of southern Ontario all the way up into the, I'm not even sure if I know the island up there, Ellesmere Island perhaps, um, the very tip of it is about 6,600 kilometers. Um, and what we're focusing on in this learning uh, program is what's in the circle in southern Alberta. So it's just again to put it into perspective, um, provinces, we have 10 of them as I mentioned, and the little stars you see in the province is the the capital of, of that particular province. So today's presenter is, I'm really happy and pleased that he's uh, here to share with us a lot of information, Gurbir Dillon. He's originally from India. He did his uh, uh, Bachelor of Science at Punjab uh, Agricultural University, his MSc, his Master's at the University of Delaware, and his PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. And he just joined Farming Smarter, which, as I mentioned earlier, is an agronomic research organization supporting, uh, supporting farmers in, uh, in southern Alberta. And he currently leads the agronomic uh, research progr program in, uh, in, in, in Canada, here in Alberta. Um, I've been through his presentation. He was kind enough to send it to me earlier today. And so what we're going to get is a broad cross-section of information on dry land crops. He's going to cover soil and climate, the major crops that we grow, 
the tillage, is, tillage practices that we put in place. It's going to talk a little bit about precision farming and then fertilization placement, timing, rate, and management. And with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Gerber. So Thank you, Rick. Stop screen sharing, and you should be able to now screen share. Thanks, Rick, for the introduction. You're welcome. Uh, Uh, I've started my screen sharing just, um, uh, can Looks you see? Good. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction and welcome everybody to the third session of the Rotary program for young adults. Uh, it's my absolute pressure to pleasure to be here, to have this chance to interact with all of you and, uh, present the session and, um, I think you have had two previous sessions that were focused on soils and climate. Uh, for this session, uh, it is focused on the dryland farming systems and their management, especially the fertility aspect of it. Uh, Trevor Deering uh, will be doing the next session that will be focused on the irrigated systems uh, in, in Alberta. Uh, so in this presentation, I will focus on Southern Alberta specifically, but on the Canadian prairies in general. And I will try to provide you with a bit of a historical context about some of the practices uh, to help gain a better uh, understanding of the context uh, around some of these practices. Um, so I will start with a very brief overview of the soils and climate. Uh, I know you have been through uh, through this information already, but uh, since it relates so much to the dryland farming, especially, I did want to uh, give a refresher and to uh, in the context of how it 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 relates to the farming. Um, the Canadian prairies are. Uh, are this are a region uh, in Canada that extends from the border of US uh, to the north of uh, three provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Uh, this, uh, this region makes up more than 80% of the Canadian agricultural land base. So it is very critical to, to the overall Canadian agriculture. Um, the soils, of uh, the prairies, they range uh, from brown to dark brown chernozems in the southern Saskatchewan and Alberta region. Um, I wonder, uh, can you see my uh, cursor? Or not really? No, I don't see it. Okay. Uh, that That's okay. Oh, now, um, now we do. Now we do. Okay. <laughs> I think it's appearing or disappearing on its own, but. Uh, yeah, um, the soils range from uh, brown to dark brown in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, black chernozems in, in the Manitoba region here, and dark gray uh, soils in the central prairies and the gray soils uh, in the north. The climate overall is cold and semi-arid semi to subhumid, and it strongly influences the distribution of soils, vegetation, and the kind of agriculture and the crops that can be grown. Uh, this map here shows accumulated precipitation for the last five years. So the, the numbers here in the legend, uh, they have to be divided by five to get uh, an annual precipitation range. But I did want to do uh, a wider range uh, to be able to show uh, a more um, a more um, realistic pattern of rainfall that because the rainfall here is quite variable from year to year. Uh, so this uh, this plot gives a fair idea of the trends in the precipitation pattern and how they are related uh, closely to the soils and how they affect the dryland agriculture. If you compare. Uh, this map to the distribution of soil zones, uh, you can see that the, it is quite similar 
to the map showing soil zones. The driest areas are located in the brown soil zone uh, of southeastern Alberta and southwestern Saskatchewan. This region has an annual precipitation of about 300 to 350 uh, millimeters. And um, if we take into account the evapotranspiration, there is a water deficit as much as up to 400 mm. Uh, the dark brown soil zones, uh, they occur in a little bit more moist uh, areas and they receive up to about 400 millimeters of rainfall. And the subhumid regions of the prairies, they can receive up to 500 mm of annual precipitation and the water deficit is less than uh, 200 mm generally. So uh, in the brown soil zone, moisture deficit is the biggest limiting factor for crop production. Um, so practices that help with moisture conservation uh, are actively followed. Uh, these practices mean, uh, these uh, practices have included summer fallow in the previous decades, but now uh, it has largely been replaced with uh, conservation tillage practices. I will talk about both of them in, in the upcoming slides. The cropping choices in this region are limited to more drought tolerant crops like wheat, lentils, chickpeas, mustard, etc. As we move uh, north uh, in the dark brown and the black soil zones, the practices for mo moisture conservation like the summer fallow or tillage are not as important, although zero till is still uh, widely followed. Uh, except in maybe very heavy soils. A wider range of crops, including cereals, pulses, oil seeds, uh, even some specialty crops can be grown. So um, the dry land agriculture in, in these regions is a, a little bit similar to the irrigated agriculture down in, in the, in the southern semi-arid areas. As we move north in the dark gray and the gray soil zones, the uh, the moisture is no longer a limiting factor, but the growing season length is, <laughs> which is generally quite short in the Canadian prairies. So the growing season can range from up to um, 110 to 120 days uh, in the southern parts of Manitoba to as less as 75 to 90 days in some of the north central parts. So that is uh, one of the limiting factors to the choice of crops too. These plots here, uh, they show trends in the total production of some of the major crops. Uh, historical trends from 1960 to 2015. So uh, from, from 1960s, up until 1960s, generally spring wheat, barley, oats, and some forage crops accounted for most of the cropland uh, in the Canadian prairies. Since then, uh, a big chunk of area under spring wheat has uh, been replaced by some of the other crops like uh, canola, durum, um, barley, pulses, etc. Uh, spring wheat still remains the most dominant crop. Uh, its production is estimated to be around uh, 9 million tons. Um, and it's fo followed by barley and canola in Alberta. Weed, barley, canola, uh, these three crops together account for about three fourths of the total crop production. These maps here, uh, they show the spatial distribution of spring weed uh, production in Canada. Um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they account for up to about 80% of the production. And these numbers are from 2018. If we add uh, the 19% from Manitoba, then um, basically all of the spring wheat production in Canada is happening in, in the prairie provinces. Generally, hardbred spring wheat is the main type grown in the prairies. It is valued mainly for its high protein content and its suitability for making pan breads. Um, Russia, Canada, US are the biggest exporters of wheat. Uh, 
the wheat production has declined a little bit in the previous decades though and the biggest reason is lower prices uh, compared to some of the other crops like canola. Uh, fusarium head blight is also uh, been a big problem, uh, especially in the more humid regions of the prairies. Uh, I think down south here uh, with the semi-arid climate, we generally have less incidence of uh, fusarium head, head blight. When the infection occurs, it can reduce yield due to poor seed filling. Um, soft white spring wheat is also um, grown uh, in southern in southern Alberta to a limited extent, generally under irrigated conditions, though. Uh, Trevor will probably talk more about it in his ne next lecture. Uh, but that type of wheat is more suitable for things like Asian noodles, uh, Arabic flatbreads, etc. Um, durum wheat is uh, mainly used for making pasta. Uh, it is grown primarily in the southern prairies where summers are hot and arid. Um, generally, in, in this semi-arid climate, uh, the durum is less susceptible to fusarium head blight and other diseases than compared to the moist areas and also less prone to some of the weather damage. Um, fusarium was uh, initially marketed to Italy uh, in 1960s and 70s, but in the recent decades, more uh, markets have opened up like US, Japan, even South America. Um, so with the opening of these new markets, exports have risen uh, dramatically. Uh, so the Canadian prairies uh, have supplied a, a big chunk up to, up to half of the world exports for Durham. Um, so there has been a considerable increase in Durham wheat area uh, largely replacing the spring wheat, uh, especially in the brown soil zone. However, the production is still about one-tenth of the spring wheat uh, on average. Getting back to uh, this graph, barley and oats are two other major crops, uh, generally grown for livestock feed. Uh, they're both more adapted to the moist cool areas and so they dominate in the black and gray soil zones. Um, however, oats have declined in area compared to uh, barley, um, generally because barley has a higher digestible energy content that makes it a better uh, feed value. And also um, barley prices rose um, due to uh, higher prices paid for malting barley. Uh, also the beef production in prairies increased and there was an increase in the feedlot system for cattle, uh, which increased the demand for barley. Um, in Southern Alberta, there is a huge area under feedlots and barley production under irrigation is quite common. Canola is another crop that has very rapidly increased in production in the last few decades. It is a cool season crop. It requires generally more moisture than wheat, uh, and it needs cool nights uh, to recover from hot days. So it's more suited to the black and gray soil zones here. Um, canola was uh, derived from uh, rapeseed crop, which was not fit for human consumption because it had higher levels of urosic acid and glucosinolates. Uh, that also made it not palatable as a feed. So in 1970s, plant breeders developed varieties that had low levels of both of these chemicals. And these, these varieties were trademarked as canola, which is actually a combination of Canadian and oil. Uh, now it's widely used for the production of cooking oil, which is used in kitchens, food processing, uh, uh, it's 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 the most used uh, uh, cooking oil in Canada and second most popular choice in United States. Um, so and it's it's a pretty popular ingredient for things like margarine, margarine salad dressings, etc. Um, pulse production has also grown pretty rapidly in the past decade. 
uh, pulse seeded area was about 2.2 million hectares in 2011, as you can see in this graph here, which was about 11 times higher than the area in 1981. So in 20 years, it has seen this huge expansion in production. In 2021, the area has uh, risen to about 3.5 million hectares. The majority of uh, pulses are also grown in uh, Canadian prairies, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, some of the bean production is uh, concentrated in Southern Ontario and Quebec. And bean is also grown as a specialty high value crop under irrigated conditions in, in Southern Alberta. Uh, some of the cultivars of bean are now adapted to the black soil zone of Saskatchewan. The development and expansion of pulse industry was quite closely tied to uh, increase in its profit, profits, uh, research into new varieties that, that were less susceptible to lodging uh, that had more disease tolerance. Um, they had better harvestability because of less lodging. And generally, they could grow in, they were uh, adapted to shorter growing seasons. Uh, and I think just the um, improve in the demand of pulse based proteins and the growth of processing facilities has also helped in this expansion. Um, now, especially with the growing trend towards uh, plant-based proteins, pulses can be an excellent source for uh, proteins and fibers. So going forward, there's a, there is a potential for even more expansion. And that's, that's uh, agronomically speaking, uh, that is a good thing uh, because um, pulses like field peas and lentils that have been generally the most common pulses that have been incorporated in crop rotations, uh, they have the ability to fix uh, their nitrogen from, atmo from the atmosphere, uh, which is called uh, biological nitrogen fixation. Uh, they do it through a symbiotic relationship with some of the soil microorganisms. Uh, and, they and this process, since it basically captures nitrogen from the air and um, supplies it into the soil that reduces the need to apply nitrogen fertilizer. And not only can it reduce the nit nitrogen requirements of the pulses, it can also reduce the, the requirements for the subsequent crops. Uh, fertilizers are generally responsible for the largest proportion of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So if we can have more pulses incorporated within the crop rotations that can help with bringing down some of the, some of those environmental concerns around greenhouse gas emissions. Um, pulses are also quite water efficient and they help also on the soil health side, they help to build soil health. Uh, so environmentally speaking, uh, they, are, they are a good addition. Chickpeas uh, are another leg legume that has been rapidly adopted, um, especially in the Saskatchewan region. In 2018, um, chick uh, chickpeas were seeded on about 150,000 hectares in Saskatchewan. Um, in Alberta, it is generally smaller compared to other pulse crops, but is more common in the southeastern side of the province, uh, which has more dry uh, climate, drier soils. Uh, chickpeas generally have a deep uh, rooting system, and they also uh, need water stress to, to uh, hasten their maturity, to uh, arrive at their maturity quickly. So the crop adapts very well to the drier regions of the Canadian prairies. This slide here, uh, this is just to give an idea of different kinds of legumes and their nitrogen fixation potential. Um, if you look at some of uh, the legumes like faba beans, field peas, lentils, they have pretty high uh, nitrogen fixation potential and they can fix up to 130 to even 267 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, some of the other legumes like chickpeas and dry beans, their 
nitrogen fixation potential is not as much, um, but they can also fix around 50 to 100 pounds of pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, now, granted that a lot of a portion of this fixed nitrogen is used by these crops, uh, but uh, studies have shown that the cereal and oilseed crops that follow pulses in rotation, they, they have shown higher yields or uh, better protein content. Um, so some of, some of the nitrogen requirements from pulses, uh, pulse nitrogen fixation can be used to uh, supply nitrogen to cereal and oilseed crops. One of the major challenges to pulse expansion in the prairies is the P root rot complex. Um, the surveys conducted in, in the prairie provinces, they have found up to 50% of the fields to be positive, although it generally favors uh, more wet conditions. Uh, in dry conditions, the spread is less severe. To prevent this disease, one of the most effective strategies is to remove pulses from crop rotations. Uh, up to even five to eight years. So that extended rotation away from a pea or a lentil crop can impact the goal of incorporation of more pulses uh, and reduction of nitrogen fertilizer application. So also the nitrogen fixation benefits that the pulse crops provide are actually lost when, when these root rots are present because roots uh, they they become completely de decayed and so they don't really support nodulation to to the normal degree. Furthermore, uh, the severity of this disease also means that producers choose don't no longer choose to include these crops in the crop rotations or the new producers that were maybe considering them become more reluctant to. Uh, to incorporate these crops. So, so this is definitely one of the challenges for pulse incorporation. Some of the other crops uh, that have not generally been grown in the Canadian prairies due to short growing seasons and low precipitation can now potentially be adopted uh, at a bigger scale with the development of some of the short season varieties um, that require fewer uh, heat units to reach maturity. Um, corn is one of the examples, and uh, the co grain production uh, by corn has actually been expanding with about 20% increase in seeded area in the province in Alberta in the last two decades. Um, Farming Smarter did a study uh, looking at uh, the adoption of uh, dryland corn in southern Alberta, and I wanted to share a couple of results uh, on, on in this study. Um, we in the study we saw that the narrow rows, uh, 50 centimeter rows, produced higher yields, and higher seeding rates produced higher yields. Um, the narrow rows, it's possible that in our short growing season, um, they help to obtain canopy closure pretty early, so there was better uh, solar radiation interception obtained uh, in these narrow rows. Also, uh, we also compared the tillage systems and generally we saw a bit of an increase in yield with the no tillage compared to conventional tillage. And that may be related to better moisture retention with no tillage compared to conventional, but also at the same time, with the no tillage, um, there was more, uh, there was a higher effect of the previous crop stubble. So the non mycorrhizal crops like canola and mustard, um, they led to a decrease in crop yield under zero till systems. Uh, the, these non mycorrhizal crops, uh, they do not associate with mycorrhizae, and so they don't leave a network of. Uh, mycorrhizal hyphae in soils, which can be critical for early phosphorus uptake of corn. Uh, these, these, this 
uh, early uptake can be especially important in Canadian prairies uh, with cold soils, especially under no-till. So, uh, and some of the legume crops like soybeans, lentils, field peas, they had higher yield, which uh, may be linked to increased nitrogen availability. Um, so my my intent with uh, with sharing these results was not only to show that some of these novel crops uh, may be adopted in 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 some semi-arid areas with better uh, short rotation varieties, but I also wanted to show some of these uh, effects of these agronomic management practices that are very important in uh, in expanding the adoption of some of these crops. Uh, hemp is another novel crop that has been rapidly gaining popularity. It's a multi-purpose crop uh, with food, fiber, livestock feed. Um, there have been some changes in federal legislation um, in Canada that have permitted the expansion of some of the uh, cultivation varieties of hemp. So uh, that has led to expansion of uh, hemp cultivation as well as the market. So uh, there has been about a 10 times increase uh, in area of hemp. In 2020, it is about 22,000 hectares uh, up from about 2,500 hectares in 1998. Uh, Alberta accounts for about 37% of total production of hemp and Farming Smarter is doing multiple studies in hemp looking at different agronomic practices, seeding rates, uh, different kinds of varieties, um, different times of seeding uh, and the response of some of these different varieties to um, nitrogen application and yield. So overall, um, we have gotten some good results and hopefully um, we can see some of the hemp, more hemp production in the coming years. This is a picture of a dryland site actually uh, up in Flair uh, in 2021, uh, which was a drought year. So most of the crops did really bad. And this is, hemp on your uh, left of the screen compared to wheat, flax, faba bean, and canola. And pretty much all of the crops are not doing great because of drought conditions, but hemp is still doing a little bit better than uh, some of the other crops. Overall, um, crop diversification uh, has been driven by increase in oil, seed, and pulse crop prices. Uh, economic policy like crop insurance, extension activities like uh, field days, workshops, annual workshops have also helped. Uh, the crop diversification helps in stabilization of farmer income. It reduces the variability in, in, in farmer's income. Workload is generally more spread out because different crops uh, can have a little bit of a difference in their seeding and, har and harvesting time. And uh, the biggest benefit, I think, is with the integrated pest management because uh, different crops in rotations help to break up the disease and in insect life cycles and provide with more herbicide options for different crops. And also some of the problem problematic weeds like perennials or herbicide resistant weeds, uh, there's a reduced buildup of uh, some of them. Generally, it comes with increased requirement of equipment, um, management of different crops and storage space for different kinds of um, grains. Uh, but overall, Canadian prairies have seen an increased diversification in crops in the last two decades, and that has been a, a good, uh, good step forward. One of the other practices that have uh, really seen a big difference in the last two, three decades is summer fallowing. Summer fallowing is uh, basically the crop land that is 
purposely kept out of production during a regular growing season. Uh, the purpose is to uh, retain some of the moisture and nutrients for the upcoming cropping cycle. And it was considered to be crucial in dryland farming, especially in the brown soil zones, uh, to be able to provide that enough extra moisture and some of the nutrients like nitrogen for the, for the next crop. Uh, but the <clears throat> But the practice is rapidly declining now. Uh, this chart here shows a very steady and rapid decrease in um, the area under summer fallow in Alberta. Um, in the dark brown soil zone of Alberta, about 40% of the agricultural land was summer fallowed and maybe 35 years ago and has declined to about 6% in 2011. Uh, Although uh, the practice has generally decreased, but with the increase in input prices, especially with the fertilizer prices increasing, uh, there are some concern that concerns that some farmers may revert back to this practice, which may offer less risks and more stability in incomes. Uh, that may be especially if we see more drought years like, like in 2021, so if moisture becomes a very limiting factor. Uh, the practice is not suitable for soils. Uh, it le leads to organic matter de degradation. And also in the fallow years, there is more wind erosion that can lead to loss of soil health uh, and degradation. <clears throat> However, generally summer fallow has largely been replaced by conservation conservation tillage practices. <laughs> um, tillage involves preparing soils for planting or seeding uh, by plowing the soils or otherwise turning it. It helps to loosen or aerate the soil. It uh, promotes steeper penetration of roots and it can help with the control of weeds. However, uh, tillage uh, can also contribute to the loss of soil moisture and also it increases the wind and water erosion. Uh, in recent years, farmers have generally uh, adopted conservative uh, tillage practices to reduce uh, moisture loss and to reduce soil erosion. Uh, basically the conservation tillage is defined by the amount of crop residue left on the ground. Um, in conservation tillage practices, uh, we retain most of the crop residue on the surface and it, it involves minimal disturbance of the soils. This graph here shows uh, the proportion of conventional tillage, conservation tillage and no-till. Um, in, uh, in 2011, there was uh, about 50, 56.4% of agricultural land in Canada that was under no-till and an additional 24.6 that was under conservation tillage, which also involves uh, minimal disturbance. So that is a huge difference from even 20 years ago when there was only about 7% of land uh, under no-till. <laughs> the reasons uh, are generally that the production costs for conservation tillage systems have declined uh, more herbicides are available for weed control. Uh, some of these herbicides have declined in cost. Conservation tillage also provides significant uh, energy savings uh, in fuel and machinery and labor. And finally, it also helps in retention of soil moisture, which can be critical, especially in some of these semi-arid semi areas. Uh, in, in, the, in the southern part of Alberta. Strip till uh, is another technique that uh, is more like a compromise between, compromise approach uh, between the no-till and the conventional tillage practices. Uh, strip till involves residue management by creating a residue free strip um, over the seeding rows. It basically, it ensures a good seeding operation uh, by removing residue from the seeding rows. 
uh, and also it conserves the soil moisture between the uh, between the seeding rows. This is uh, a video that it show that is showing strip till in action. Um, generally, studies have found that strip till helps in improving germination, but also increases uh, soil moisture retention. Uh, it, it improves germination generally by helping with uh, improving soil temperature in the seeding rows. Uh, generally for widely spaced crops like uh, corn and sugar beets, uh, an approach like strip till can make sense. And in, in other crops, which are not as widely spaced, uh, it's still being uh, looked at, researched upon. Uh, Farming Smarter is also leading um, a, a study in canola where we are looking at strip till and uh, no till and comparing how much benefits uh, compare among these practices. These are the pictures of air seeders. Um, so with, with, with the widespread adoption of no-till, uh, farmers need seed equ equipment that can handle the residue uh, on the surface, and that can also minimize the soil disturbance during the seeding operations. So seeder technology uh, that includes the opener design, packer, wheel design, etc. they also need to develop along with the, the no-till practices. Um, the air seeders uh, provide a lot of these options and adaptations to meet a variety of these conditions. Uh, they use a cultivator frame that is attached to um, the seed and fertilizer delivery system. Uh, the delivery system uses air pressure to, uh, to basically deliver uh, seed or fertilizer from the machine to the ground and there are ground openers that help with the seed or fertilizer placement. These uh, machines, they increase the efficiency of seeding operations uh, they, because of higher capacity for seed and fertilizers. They also maintain a good soil, uh, seed soil contact even with, even with the surface residues. And this picture, uh, this video here, it shows our small plot seeder uh, in action. Um, perhaps the most important feature uh, is that they enable one pass seeding and fertilizer operation so that the fertilizers can be side banded uh, safely while, while you are seeding. Uh, that saves uh, time and money for, for the farmers and compared with the broadcasters, it's also environmentally a better option. I will go um, into more details about the side bending and broadcast in, in, in some of the next slides. But before that, uh, I also wanted to talk about the precision planters. The precision planters, um, the difference of precision planters from air seeders is that they use vacuum force instead of the air pressure uh, to, to singulate the seeds. Uh, they have this plate with holes and a vacuum pressure that is holding one seed at each of these holes. And when the planter is uh, operating, uh, this plate rotates and drops one seed uh, after a precise distance. So uh, the seed placement with the precision planters is more precise compared to the air seeders. And sometimes they also provide a better depth control. Uh, so overall, they are able to provide better uh, seeding and better emergence compared to the air seeders. They have generally been used uh, for the row crops like corn, um, soybeans, etc. cetera. But uh, recently they have been adopted for some of the other crops like uh, seed production in canola. Um, we did a study to compare the air drill and the precision planter in canola. And this, uh, this air shot 
basically uh, is comparing different kinds of different plots from different treatments. And you can see that the emergence with, especially at lower seed rates, with the air drill is pretty spotty compared to the precision planter. Um, so precision planter did lead to better emergence in canola. And this picture is showing um, crop stands for air drill and precision planter. Again, the precision planter at narrow row spacing shows the uh, much healthier, much fuller uh, plant stands compared to the air drill. And uh, under irrigated conditions, we did find a yield advantage with the precision planter too, compared to the air drill. But uh, something else to note here is that the precision planter at the wide row spacing, um, at 20 inch spacing instead of 12 inch row spacing, that led to a lesser yield compared to both the air drill and the narrow row planter. Um, Generally, uh, the farmers that have adopted uh, the precision planters, since they are using their systems from sugar beets or other wide row crops, uh, they have generally adopted that same wide row systems. And this study showed that that might lead to lesser yield. So again, uh, another example of how agronomic management practices like seed row spacing can sometimes uh, make a huge difference uh, in the in in crop yield. We also looked at precision planting in some of the pulse crops, and found a higher emergence in in most of the crops. In chickpeas, emergence was thirty percent higher. In faba bean, sixteen percent. In field peas, twenty percent. Um, there was also a very visible difference in the stands. Uh, with the air drill, there were empty spots in the stands, which can lead with problems like weeds, et cetera. Uh, with the precision planters, the stands were more uniform. So that can help with competition with weeds. But they were also more even in emergence, uh, more evenly staged, staged in terms of timing. So that can help with uh, um, more precise application of some of the chemicals like especially plant growth regulators, uh, fungicides that have to be applied at a specific growth stage. With better emergence, some of these um, precision planters can also help to cut some of the seeding rates, especially with the crops where uh, the cost of seeds is high. So that can reduce the input costs for the farmers. Now, moving on to fertilizers. So um, effective fertilizer management is a critical component uh, of any cropping system. And the aim should be to uh, maximize not only the economic production, but also to protect the long-term environmental quality. And one of the major components of fertilizer management is fertilizer placement relative to the crop and its roots. Uh, in uh, Canadian prairies, we generally do broadcast seed-placed fertilizer application or the banded fertilizer application. Uh, the broadcast fertilizer application is among the most inefficient as, uh, as far as nutrient uptake is concerned, but it is also the fastest and inexpensive, not expensive, and doesn't need much of the machinery or labor or fuel costs compared to some of the other application methods. Um, however, it does increase nitrogen loss due to volatilization, which is conversion of uh, ammonium to ammonia gas, and also loss of nitrogen by wind and water erosion. Some of the immobile nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, they can get stranded above the active root zone, so they may not be accessible for root uptake. 
uh, some of these uh, drawbacks can be uh, can be solved basically by incorporating the broadcast fertilizers. Another method is uh, through seed placement. In this method, uh, there is a close proximity of nutrients to roots, so uh, that can be a spe uh, that can be good, especially for immobile nutrients like phosphorus and potassium, um, especially if the soils are cold or they have low uh, availability of these nutrients, uh, because the nutrients are available to the to the growing roots. They also allow for one pass fertilizer application. So that reduces uh, labor costs. Uh, but the application rate with this method can be limited depending on the which fertilizer is used, what is the soil moisture, and what is the um, seedbed utilization or the width of um, seed and fertilizers relative to the seed row. Some of the fertilizer types are also not suitable for this met method. Um, they can um, reduce crop emergence or um, uh, lead to seedling mortality. Um, urea is one of those fertilizers. It can lead to ammonia toxicity. And some of the other fertilizers include potash, ammonium sulfate. Uh, they can also have the salt effect um, due to um, when they dissolve in the soil uh, water, the, the salt toxicity can lead to mortality in some of these seedlings. Generally, um, generally urea is the most problematic and the, the other fertilizers are not as damaging as the ammonia toxicity. The banned fertilizer application is basically a fertilizer application in a narrow row uh, at a depth and also uh, slightly to the side of the of the of the seeds. Uh, it is efficient for most fertilizers because uh, the fertilizer is below the seed and the roots will generally grow towards the fertilizer source. So. Um, Banding creates a greater distance between the seeds and the fertilizers, and this allows a opportunity to ap apply um, a higher fertilizer rates during seeding without the risk for ammonia toxicity. For nitrogen, uh, generally immobile immobilization is not a problem with banding because uh, the fertilizers are banded below the crop residues, which could have otherwise immobilized some of the nitrogen. Similarly, for phosphorus, potassium, uh, there is minimal contact between uh, soils and the fertilizers. So the sorption of fertilizers to soil is also reduced. Um, generally, uh, so generally, the nutrient loss is limited with, with this application method. However, it can be expensive, especially it, it, with higher machinery and fuel costs. And it can also lead to some soil disturbance, which can lead to a uh, loss of soil moisture. <clears throat> there are also some, some, a few other methods like dribble banding, which, which is the application of liquid fertilizers in narrow strips on the soil surface. It is generally uh, done in crop. It's more comparable to broadcasting than to banding and it can suffer from same limitations as broadcasting like more volat volatilization, immobil immobilization, and more stratification of nutrients. Um, then there is also foliar application of fertilizers, uh, but generally the leaves cannot absorb enough nutrients for plant growth and without rainfall or irrigation, foliar application is not very effective. Um, deep banding is another uh, approach. Uh, in, in, we did a study around deep banding of some of the immobile nutrients, where the uh, principle was to see if we can deep band some of these nutrients at around five to six inch depth uh, and do that periodically around 
three to four, four years, every three to four years and see how it compares to the normal shallow banding. Um, this video shows uh, how the deep banding was done. Uh, now this approach can provide farmers with some more options, especially if the fertilizer costs are low, but like you can see, it also leads to more soil disturbance, although it's not the same as cultivating or some of the other tillage practices. Uh, in this study, we didn't really see a difference in yield between the shallow and deep banding. So ultimately the decision really came to the logistics at the farm uh, and the fertilizer prices and whether um, uh, what the pre preference of, uh, of, of a farmer is. But we didn't really see an advantage or uh, a disadvantage with going with either the deep or shallow banding. Um, the other thing to consider with fertilizer management is the timing. Uh, in Western Canada, uh, fertilizers can be applied in fall or in spring prior to seeding or during seeding. Um, banding of nitrogen fertilizers is quite common in fall because nitrogen uh, fertilizer prices are low during this time. Uh, it should be done when temperature is around seven, eight, soil, uh, uh, is seven to eight degrees Celsius um, because uh, the microbial processes are minimized. So that will minimize the loss of nitrogen. Um, should time of year might be a bit better indicator because it is important that the temperature is not fluctuating. So the temperature has to be consistently below that seven to eight degrees Celsius range. Um, the greatest risk is with the fall application is that in the spring, when the soils are saturated with the spring snow melt, uh, there can be denitrification losses, which can be pretty high. Uh, the other timing, is spring, uh, which is more in close proximity to when, when uh, crops need those nutrients. Um, nutrients are not stored over the winter, so they are not susceptible to some of the spring losses. Uh, it also allows for more precise nutrient application based on uh, the soil analysis and the spring moisture conditions that can be considered. Um, also high disturbance field operations can be avoided in the fall if, if, if we do spring application, um, which can help with more crop residue in the fall and allows for more moisture retention. And it also allows the possibility of combining the seeding and fertilizers into one pass operation. Uh, so um, it has a few benefits, but the soil disturbance associated with spring can dry out the seed bed, which can reduce the yield potential. And also the timing, uh, it is pretty tight during that time of the season. So time required to complete seeding and other field operations may increase. A common practice is also to split the application between fall and spring. So a base rate is applied in the fall and that can be followed in spring by application based on um, the soil test, soil test recommendation and uh, spring moisture. This table here shows the relative effectiveness of uh, time and method of uh, fertilizer application. Uh, and as you can see, um, for the dry soils, uh, the fall banded application is actually quite effective. Uh, it is as effective as the spring banded application. Uh, when we move to the more moist areas though, I think uh, the spring denitrification comes more into play. So it is not as effective, but uh, in the semi-arid conditions here, uh, the fall banded application is, is effective and, it can be more practical under farm conditions. 
the application rates uh, they are recommended based on the chemical analysis of soils they are specific to each field uh, it can be important especially following years like drought years like the one we had uh, in 2021 uh, where because of moisture limitation, the crop growth was not as, as good. So sometimes there is residual nitrogen left. Uh, so you have to uh, test the soils to see what the background um, reserves for different nutrients are and how much do you need to apply uh, to, to fulfill the crop requirements based on um, their field yield potential and, or the response curves. The application can also uh, be based on field variability. And uh, nowadays, there is also research into uh, variable rate nitrogen, uh, depending on that, that prescribes different rates um, uh, for different parts of the fields. Overall, uh, an economic and environmentally sustainable fertilizer management uh, requires science-based application of um, right source where we match the fertilizers to crop needs, right rate, where the amount of fertilizer is based on crop needs and right time so that there is maximum uptake and minimum loss and right place to so that the nutrients are where the crops can use them. Uh, these principles are collectively known as for our nutrient stewardship. Um, it's a universal uh, principle that is followed in different countries, different places. It has to be adapted to different regions depending on their, uh, their climates and soils, etc. So some of the some of the general guidelines for southern Alberta, would be uh, using ammonium-based uh, fertilizers for fall application to reduce uh, denitrification losses, using some of the enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Um, that these fertilizers basically use different kinds of physical and chemical barriers to reduce uh, losses through denitrification or volatilization. And there are some studies going on to see if they help with increasing crop yield. And the jury is still out on that, but they, some studies have definitely shown that they help with nitrous oxide emissions. So uh, even if the yield advantage is not there or not as much as expected, they're definitely useful on the environmental side uh, by reducing some of these greenhouse gas emissions. And they can be used when there is higher potential of some of these losses like in fall application, or if there is surface application of fertilizers uh, being done in when the crop is standing. And the application rates should be based on soil testing uh, and the crop yield potentials. With that, uh, I thank you all. And please let me know if you have any questions. Well done, Gavir. Well done. Uh, I would have to say literally and figuratively, you've covered a lot of ground today. Um, and I found it most informative. Uh, some stuff I remembered or had, let's call it recalled. But at the same time, uh, I learned some new things today. So thank you for that. We've got a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, that, are, that are in the chat. And I'll just go through them now for you. Could you um, stop screen sharing and then we'll have a better oh. picture of everybody here and i will try to get through all of these questions here okay so the first question came from philippe uh, i have a question why in the graphics on the years 2002 have a decrease in production now i think graham covered it because 2002 was a quite a dry year was it not uh I, to be honest, I don't really remember. I was still, I think, uh, 
in India at that time. <laughs> so I, I, I don't remember, but yeah, generally the precipitation patterns are pretty different year to year and crop yield potential depends very heavily on the precipitation during a given year. Um, we have been doing some studies, three or four year studies, and 2021 and 2019 were drought years and 2020 had a decent rainfall and the difference in yield is, uh, uh, it's not comparable to any other treatment. So uh, I, I will presume that if there was a low yield, there, it was most likely due to a uh, low rainfall. What about last year, 2021? That was certainly considered a dry year. How much was production off? Uh, yeah, I think we saw a very, very significant uh, drop in production. Uh, for for some of the studies, I would say um, it was probably not even 50% of what the levels were in uh, 2020. Um, and some of the treatments that showed a very significant effect in 2020 didn't really show any effect in 2021 because moisture was the limiting factor. So uh, other treatments didn't really affect yields as much. Uh, on the provincial level, uh, I'm not really sure how much the production dropped down, but uh, yeah, I'll have to check it. It was significant for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tulio is asked, is it common to use inoculants on other legumes as it is common in soybeans to help with nitrogen fixation? Is it, uh, is it products based on trich trichoderma? That's an interesting one. Yeah, um, the inoculants are very common for sure. Um, I, I don't think the products are based on trichoderma. I think... Uh, if Trevor can jump in, he might uh, add something on to that. We can hear you, Trevor. No, it's okay. <laughs> this mic is probably not working. But yeah, um, the inoculants are very common in legumes here. Uh, I haven't heard of trichoderma, but generally inoculants are required to uh, enable good nitrogen fixation. Okay, and Vitor is asking, um, do you have a lot of problems with, with some specific pests? Vitor, maybe you need to expand on that. Are you talking uh, insect pests, disease pests, or or uh, what? And what in crop? Insect. Insects. Can we hold that question until? Um, Next week. Okay. <laughs> you got a quick answer, Gubir? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, we have some problems with the insect pests. Uh, in 2021, we had a new one, grasshoppers, affected uh, some of the crop production. Uh, but yeah, definitely um, insect pests are, uh, are a problem here. Uh, I'm trying to, there are some some of the ones that are more specific to different crops. Uh, what about yeah. wheat midge? Is wheat midge a problem anymore? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I think wheat midge is still pretty common, uh, at least in some areas. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so wheat midge and wheat stem sawfly on dry land are still um, still big pests down here. So yeah. Trevor, what do they do to, to manage them? Mainly it is rotation, I believe, um, and also picking proper varieties. Um, so hard red spring wheats um, that are more resistant to the stem sawfly um, and and mainly rotation as well. So solid stem versus hollow stem, I guess. Eh? Yeah. And we're, okay. we still monitor for it too. Um, we're Farming Smarter is actually part of the pest monitoring network here in Alberta. And so we help to 
monitor the fields uh, in the Lethbridge and Tabor um, counties. Um, so trying to still help farmers understand those patterns and, and plan ahead of time. Mother nature is challenging at times, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tulio, in Brazil, we have a lot of problems because it is a tropical country with a relatively high temperature and humidity, having problems with phytopathology. Are there many problems in Canada, for example, like fungal? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's quite similar to like Tulio said. Uh, a lot of these fungal diseases are correlated to humidity. So some of the diseases like uh, Fraserum head blight or Phanomyces, they might be uh, less common in the semi-arid areas, although we do still have that problem. But as we move north, uh, it's more humid. And I think these diseases are a bigger problem in those areas. So yeah, for sure, um, we do have some of these fungal diseases, uh, the root rots impulses. Um, in canola, there is club root, but I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a soil borne disease. Uh, and Fusarium head bite in, in cereals. So yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Marcelli would like to know, in your point of view, what is the biggest challenge of growing any crop, crops in Alberta? Um, I think the biggest challenges would be uh, the moisture availability, especially in the southern regions and and the length of growing season. Uh, those are the two limiting factors. Uh, with the length of growing season, that, that means we are limited to certain crops that have to mature within that growing season of about 110 days. Uh, 100 to 110 days. Um, so some of the uh, some of the crops, uh, specialty crops uh, that have a longer growing season cannot really mature on time here. Um, with the crops that we do grow, I think moisture is the biggest limiting factor. And we see a huge difference in irrigated and dryland yields uh, all the time. Uh, farming smarter in we do trials on both uh, irrigated and dryland systems and generally there is a huge difference in in yields uh, also the availability of rainfall timing of rainfall can affect uh, seeding and other operations uh, so that's i would say the biggest challenge okay thank you uh, Tulio would like to know, is precision agriculture also highly used for variable rate fertilization, drone application, etc.? cetera? Um, the precision planting would be a little bit different from, from this. And the precision planting is just a seeding technique which uh, has more precise placement of seeds in terms of within a seed row or with the seed depth. Uh, however, uh, the variable rate fertilization and drone application are catching up in terms of, um, uh, especially with the increasing fertilizer prices and with some environmental concerns, there is uh, a push for more research into some of these techniques. And my uh, uh, my take is that at this time, uh, probably a little bit more research is needed to make them more practical uh, to be adopted at a field scale. Uh, although some for some some of the like variable rate irrigation etc has been adopted a little bit more, uh, but down down the line, maybe in five years, we could see more variable rate fertilization uh, and pesticide applications being done by taking into account all of the variability uh, in the fields here. 
I think you said most of the precision seeding now is done in wide row crops like corn and sugar beets. Yeah, the precision seeding uh, was more common in the row crops like uh, corn and sugar beets. Uh, but some of the other uh, crops like canola, pulses, durum, uh, especially with canola seed production, some of the uh, producers have tried precision seeding and they have had good results. So uh, they, uh, they asked us about it and we ran some trials. And in our trials, we have generally seen that precision seeding for sure helps with better emergence in almost all the crops. Uh, like the ones that we tested, uh, including hemp, uh, wheat, uh, pulses, and canola. In some of these crops, uh, better emergence did translate to good yield. Um, in, in some instances, it did not because generally the crop yields are quite plastic. So they are sometimes able to um, adjust to lower seedling emergence too. Uh, but generally, if it's a high precipitation year or if it's irrigated conditions, uh, there is an advantage with using precision seeding because uh, with more precise placement of seeds, it basically helps with reducing the competition. So I think the yield potential of the crops, uh, it increases. And there is also, it also helps with uh, competition with the weeds, et cetera. So we did see an advantage in canola and in some pulse crops like chickpeas, there was a definite advantage. In other pulse crops, there was better emergence, but it didn't really translate as much into yield. Uh, in hemp, we did see better emergence. So we are into the fourth year of that study. So hopefully those results, uh, we will uh, publish those soon or do all the data analysis soon. I guess the the barrier right now for precision seeders is if you wanted to go to canola or a broad acre crop like wheat or barley, equipment size would have to be scaled up considerably, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, some of these precision planters are designed for wide row crops. So if they are adopted using that same configuration, uh, those wide rows can actually end up hurting the yield. Like I, sh I, I showed some of the slides with canola. And in general, two precision planters are pretty expensive equipment. So, and that was, I think, one of the considerations when we did that study for a range of crops, because if precision planters can actually be useful for a bigger range of crops, then that justifies the cost of acquiring equipment uh, more than if they're useful for only one or two crops. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, on the engineering side of it, they definitely need to make those equipment modifications uh, for the bigger scale. And also, uh, they have been generally used on the eastern side of Canada. Um, and some of the adaptations, I think, also need to happen on the zero tell side of it. Uh, they do have uh, residue management, etc. But I think a little bit more work can happen on that side, too. Okay. I think we got time for one last question, and this comes from Vitor. Do you know the percentage of volatized ammonia from urea in your soils? Um, I know that uh, uh, generally the overall loss of nitrogen from volatilization and other other processes like uh, denitrification is pretty high. It's up to even 50%. Uh, I wouldn't know the percentage of volatilized ammonia from urea, but I, I am expecting that it's, it is pretty high in that same range of 40 to 50%. Um, especially, I think it also depends on what kind of practices are being followed uh, for foliar application or surface applications. Uh, volatilization losses will be much higher. And um, I think uh, if with the band placement, they'll probably be lower. Uh, so some of the in-crop applications of nitrogen, we definitely need to take a look at them and see if they actually help with protein yields like, like they're set to, or if it's more uh, 
just uh, that the farmers are spending more money and sending it basically into the atmosphere. Vitor, did you want to share with uh, Gurbir your um, experience today? Or... Because yeah, you were uh, out, you were out measuring ammonia mm -hmm. and uh, nitrous oxide, correct? Correct. Uh, I work. I'm working here with uh, with coffee with cough crop, and we are we are studying. We are make, making some research with the volatilization of ammonia from different sources of uh, nitrogen fertilizers and uh, the emission of uh, nitrous oxide from different sources too. And here in Brazil, uh, in cough crops, we lose about 30% of N from urea. Mm -hmm. And in cough crop, I don't know exactly in other crops, but mm -hmm. it's a big problem here because our farmers usually applicate the urea when we have a high, a high moisture on mm -hmm. soils and a high temperature. So we lose a lot of, lot of fan and uh, we are trying to change it here in Brazil. And uh, I have a question about uh, the carbon footprint. In Canada, mm -hmm. do you have some technologies to, to quantify the emissions inside the farm? like uh, the emissions from fertilizers, from lame, uh, from the machines? I know that in Western Canada, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's pretty tr tricky to uh, esti estimate the carbon footprint or the total emissions. Uh, generally, even within the studies, when they, uh, when they use uh, uh, different methodologies, it's, it's pretty variable. But in, in, in Western Canada, we use the HOLOS model uh, that was developed uh, at AAFC Lethbridge, I think a few years ago. That is quite common here. And at, it's also very suitable to like uh, use for use by the farmers in that they can plug different kinds of practices or changes and that it gives a, an estimation of how those changes or different kinds of practices affect the um, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a firm-based model. Is it possible that we could get the link to that model that uh, we could share with these folks? Uh, sure, I can. Not, not necessarily now, you can do it afterwards. I think we, we probably got to close the session off. I really want to thank you for all the information you shared um with everybody today and, and and address the questions i feel much more informed than i did when i started here and uh, i hope our our participants from south america and brady from coldale alberta um yeah, i hope everybody enjoyed today's session and um, i think we'll just close it off now we'll look forward to seeing the group back on wednesday when we're going to hear about uh irrigated crop management production from uh, from Trevor. He's been on, I think, most of the the day today um, uh, observing, monitoring, and he even helped answering a question. So thank you, Trevor, for, for stepping up. We look forward to hearing you all about irrigated crops, uh, which I know is near and dear to uh, Brady's, Brady's home. So uh, have a good evening, everybody, and uh, we'll see everybody Wednesday, 4, 4 o'clock or a little earlier. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to also thank everybody for participating, and it was a great experience for me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gerber. Thanks, Gerber. Take care, guys. Thank you. Have a good day.